In this video, we're going to talk about what was probably the first model of the atom that you were introduced to, and that's the Bohr model for the hydrogen atom. But we're going to go into more detail here about how that was developed and what it means. So let's look at that model. First, we're going to have a proton. Our positively charged proton is just going to sit fixed in the middle of the atom. It's the only thing in the nucleus for this element. And then there's going to be a single electron negatively charged, which is going to be rotating around that proton in some orbit there. Okay, so some quantities that we're interested in. First is going to be R here, radius, the distance from the proton to the electron, and that electron is also going to have some velocity, v, which is a vector going out here, perpendicular to r. Uh, we're not going to worry too much about it being a vector. We're going to just be concerned about its magnitude for the most part. So to examine this system, let's first review a few concepts from general physics about the differences between linear and angular motion. So uh, let's get linear first. So let's have linear in blue and angular in green. So first is motion. Okay, so let's make a table of some quantities that we have in linear motion and that we also have in angular motion. So first up in linear, linear motion, our resistance to acceleration is going to be m, the mass, and in angular motion, that's going to be the moment of inertia. And those two are related from the equation that moment of inertia equals mass times radius squared assuming some circular orbit with a fixed radius r. Then, next up, we have velocities. So we have, in linear motion, the velocity just v, the direction and magnitude that the particle is moving. And in angular motion, we have the angular velocity omega. So what relates these is you have linear velocity equals 2 pi times the radius times the angular frequency nu. So using frequency nu here just in cycles per second or hertz. And that also equals r times omega, the angular uh, velocity, where omega is just 2 pi times nu the frequency here. Okay, and then next we're interested in momentum. So we have linear momentum denoted by P and then angular momentum, very important quantity by this cursive L I'll use for that. So these two are, we have linear momentum equals just mass times velocity. So mass of the electron times its velocity is its linear momentum. And then angular momentum is just going to be moment of inertia, the corresponding mass, times angular velocity, the corresponding velocity. So these two correspond to each other quite well. Okay, then lastly, we're interested in the different expressions for kinetic energy between these two types of motions. And kinetic energy we're going to denote by the letter T, and that is going to be just T in both cases, because kinetic energy is a scalar, so it's the same whether you're rotating or whether you're moving linearly. So if you're moving linearly, you would have it equals mass times velocity squared over 2, or linear momentum squared over 2 times mass. And for the angular case, what we would have is kinetic energy equals the analogs in this case, 
moment of inertia times angular velocity squared over 2, which also equals angular momentum squared over 2 times moment of inertia. Okay, so that's just a review of general physics concepts in case we're a little rusty on that so we can analyze this system here. So if we have a reference frame where this electron is just going to be stationary throughout its orbit, then what, we want, what we're going to see is for the proton, the electron, for anything to stay stationary, the forces acting on it need to be equal. So there's going to be one force acting which is pulling the electron towards the proton, and that's going to be the Coulomb force. And then in order to keep that orbit stationary in a rotating reference frame, what we also have acting on it is a force which is pulling away, which is a centrifugal force. Then the result is in a rotating reference frame, the electron is going to remain stationary when these two forces equal each other. So let me just say that those two put them in parentheses and that they are going to be equal to one another. So moving to the other side now, um, saying what the values of each of those are. Well, the Coulomb force, that's just the attraction between two charged particles. So that's going to be E is the charge of the electron. The proton has the same charge but a but the opposite um, sign. So that is going to be E squared over 4 pi epsilon naught is a constant factor in that expression. Epsilon naught is just a physical constant. You can look up the value of it. And then the separation between them squared, R squared. And then corresponding to what we wrote below, it's going to be equal to the centrifugal force which in this case is going to be the mass of the electron times its velocity squared over r. <clears throat> okay, so in this case we have two unknowns in this equation. We don't know what r is and we don't know what v is. So in order to help solve this system, Bohr, Niels Bohr, posited that um, angular momentum is going to be quantized. So in 1911 he proposed that the hydrogen atom is going to have some quantized angular momentum. Okay, so what is that going to look like? Well, our angular momentum, if we look at it, if we say L equals if you substitute in all these equations here, you'll find the mass of the electron times its velocity times its radius equals, and then he proposed that this quantization is equal to n times h bar. h bar is Planck's constant divided by 2 pi. So let me just write that on the side there, that h bar is just h over 2 pi. That's just a different way of writing Planck's constant that makes it convenient sometimes because in these angular quantities here because of this p equation right there we get a lot of two pi's so sometimes it's convenient to write h bar instead of h okay so now let's follow through the, con the consequences of this we've got another v here r here so now we've got two equations and we've got two unknowns so we can solve for v and we can solve for r and we can figure out what the radius is for if we assume these stationary circular orbits for the hydrogen atom. Okay, so taking the first equation right here, I can say that V equals nh bar, dividing both sides by me and r, mass of the electron and r. I get this expression here. Then if I take the top equation here, and I'm going to substitute in the v squared that I get here, then in there I'm going to put me v squared over r equals 
repeating the ME over R, V is equal to N H bar over M E R. Then I square that. So that gives me M E N squared H bar squared over R. I pick up an R here, and this R gets squared, so that becomes R cubed. And then there's an ME on the bottom that gets squared. And that is it. Um, there's an ME on the top and on the bottom, so I'm just going to go ahead and cancel out the one on the top and cancel the square. So I'm left with just one, one mass of the electron on the bottom. Okay, so that's the left side of our equation that we had up here. So let's, set, let's continue and set that equal to the right side of the equation. So I'm going to have e squared over 4 pi epsilon naught r squared equals n squared h bar squared over r cubed times me. Next thing I'm going to do is multiply, cross multiply both of these sides here. That's going to give me r cubed me e squared from these two t terms equals 4 pi epsilon naught r squared n squared h bar squared. Okay, so what do I see on both sides? I've got an r squared here and an r cubed here, so I'm going to cancel out that r, that r squared, and I'm going to cancel out the cube here, leaving one factor of r left there. So all that's left to do is just divide both sides by mee squared, so I have only r left on the left side here. So I have r equals 4 pi epsilon naught n squared h bar squared over me times e squared. Now this is a value of r which has only physical constants and and numbers in it. 4 is a number, pi is a number, epsilon naught is a constant, n squared is an integer which we pick. It's the lowest we can pick is 1. h bar squared is a constant, mass of the electron is a constant, charge of the electron is a constant. So if we take all these values and then we substitute them in for their respective places in the position, I'm not going to do the calculation, but you can look up the values and confirm this for yourself. You'll have that R equals 52.9, well, let's do it in standard SI units first. It would be 5.29 times 10 to the minus 11th meters which is which is 52.9 picometers, pico being a trillionth of a meter. That's a really bad M. Let's do that again. And we also know that the quantity angstrom, which is kind of a nice unit to use for uh, chemical length scales, which one angstrom equals 0 0.1 nanometers equals 100 picometers, or, and also 10 to the minus 10th meters. In terms of angstroms, our final result is that the radius of the hydrogen atom, if we pick n equals 1, becomes 0 0.529 angstroms. And that's if n equals 1, n equals 1 being the lowest lowest radius, lowest energy ground state of, of the hydrogen atom. And this quantity here is called the Bohr radius. So this is the radius you get <clears throat> for the hydrogen atom for the ground state, the lowest energy state, whenever you assume that hydrogen, that the electrons are in fixed circular orbits and that you have quantized angular momentum. This is the lowest radius, lowest energy solution you get for the hydrogen atom. And in the next video we'll continue on and see what the energy levels are once we substitute 
this radius back into the expression for the energy.